Hey guys, why did the lure plant not cross the road? Because it was in a vegetative state. <laughs> hey everybody, Jazzy here with another Don't Starve Together guide. And today it is my moral imperative to talk to you about one of the oft misunderstood, commonly overlooked, and indisputably most underrated items in the game. While unassuming in its appearance, this little leafy dude can be one of the best tools in your survival belt, helping you to do stuff like mass farm stacks of crops in a matter of seconds, single-handedly protect your entire base from seasonal dangers, provide defense against other mobs, and even help to take down one of the hardest bosses in the game. Sounds too good to be true? Welcome to the wide and wonderful world of lure plants. Okay, first some basic info. Lure plants have a chance of spawning on the surface every three to five days during spring in any area recently visited by a player. They will not spawn on cave rock, sandy, rocky, or any crafted flooring. So if you're spending a lot of time around non-eligible turf, your spawn rates will decrease. While you could get four or five lure plants in a single spring, you're probably doing a mix of exploration and basing, so you will typically get two to three by the end of the season. The spawning rate is also affected by the number of active players. The more players, the lower the chance of a new spawn. The nice thing is that they are updated on the map immediately so you can find them easily when they do spawn. It starts off in a sort of sleep mode where the petals and roots are all retracted. After two days the petals open up, roots will seep into the ground and eye plants will pop up in the surrounding area. Soon after, the meat bowl will display a lure. This will be leafy meat by default, or sometimes it's a meat recently acquired from an eye plant. This lure can be picked from the bulb, after which the eye plants will all recede and the bulb will return to its sleep mode. After another two days, eye plants will start to spawn again and another lure will be displayed. Lure plants will not be active during winter. The eye plants will eat most items on the ground and store them inside the lure plant where they will slowly be digested, one item at a time, every 20 seconds. They are also hostile towards any mob or player besides wormwood, and will actually eat smaller mobs such as butterflies, birds, and bees. They only have 30 HP so you can easily slice your way to the meat bulb with a spear. Defeating the bulb will cause the fleshy bulb, its current lure, and all undigested items to drop to the ground. Because lure plants can spawn on most natural turf, it's good to be cautious when leaving items on the ground. There's nothing worse than an eye plant gobbling up stacks of cobblestone or other important items because digested items are effectively deleted from your world. Alright, that's the basics. Now let's talk about how these floral abominations can dramatically improve your survival chances in DST. Use number one, trash can. What better use for a gaping retinal maw than as a maw, maw, maw? Hey, maw! Get off the dang roof! What better use for a gaping retinal maw than as a compact and easily assembled trash disposal unit? Tired of those low percentage tools and weapons lying around your base? Perhaps you enjoy sharpening your kiting skills on the local bee population and as a result have more stingers than you would ever need. Or if you're like me, you play on a dedicated endless server and just want all the rot, guano, manure, and 1% dark swords to go away. So plant a bulb in your base and leave open a single tile for an eye plant to spawn. Then just drop your disposables, recyclables, and compostables with your friendly EnviroBro anytime you want. Just keep the rest of the area turfed up accordingly so you don't get too many Save the Planet demonstrations outside your door. Use number two, food. Leafy meat ain't too bad as a food source. For a character with default hunger drain, you can get through a day with four of these cooked up. You can't use them in crock pots, but you can give them to a bird for eggs. It's basically free food, and as simple to set up as planting a collection of bulbs on eye plant proof turf, then just harvest every two days. I have not seen this mentioned anywhere, but I have noticed players on my server doing this. Bulbs planted on a boat will produce leafy meat as usual, but will not spawn any eye plants even if the boat is close to a shore with natural turf. And four boards for a boat is definitely cheaper than a 5x5 grid of crafted turf. Use number three, defense. The eye plants do not do a ton of individual damage, but in large numbers they can dish it out. Problem is they die quickly, so don't expect them to take care of all your fighting needs. They can be useful in a pinch though, especially against mobs such as bees which can be straight up eaten, and spiders which can be stunlocked. As far as hound waves go, they won't be super useful to you outside of spring. The reason is because they are incredibly flammable and a single red hound death will instantly ignite every eye plant and burn the bulb. 
Against blue hounds, they're fine, you just don't get eye plants in winter. But if you're out in the field and need to distract a hostile mob, these guys will certainly do the trick. Use number four, Summer Proof Base. As I said, lure plants are highly flammable, and we can actually use this attribute to protect our base from wildfires during summer. Lure plants will be prioritized by the wildfire mechanic, and if there is a lure plant within range of the player when a smoldering event triggers, it will always target the bulb before anything else. Use this to your advantage and place lure plants throughout your base, taking care to keep a safe radius between the bulb and any flammable structures. It was discovered a couple of years back that lure plants placed within range of an ice fling -omatic could effectively increase the flingo's protection area against wildfires. The idea was that as long as a player was within range of any of these lure plants, those plants would be the first to smolder and then get extinguished by the flingo. With efficient placement of lure plants, you could potentially get up to four times the covered range with a single fling -omatic. I will provide a link to Fredo's video demonstrating the build. Use number five, crop farms. One really unique mechanic about the eye plants is that they can bite off grass and twigs from nearby crops. This makes lure plants one of the fastest methods for harvesting crops. A single patch of eye plants can clear over a hundred crops in a matter of seconds. Then defeating the meat bulb will cause all the harvested crops to fall onto the ground, already conveniently stacked for you. This is something that would normally take the player several minutes of harvesting. There has been plenty of discussion over optimal crop positioning around a lure plant in order to maximize harvests. But if you want to get started with a farm like this, just pick a spot near your base that's generally unloaded, plant the meat bulb, then plant your assortment of crops in a radius. Doesn't have to be super neat, just make sure to leave a little bit of space between crops to allow eye plants to spawn. The reason you want this area unloaded most of the time is because you want to smack the bulb right after a harvest and get all the crops back. If the area is constantly loaded, then the eye plants will always be eating and gradually digesting your crops, and you won't get a good return on your harvests. Wickerbottom is indisputably the best character to use these farms because she can spam applied horticulture books and just chain harvest after harvest. The meat bulb has a considerable inventory size so you can get stacks upon stacks of crops at mind numbing speed. Just read until all the books are gone and then kill the bulb and shower yourself in grass. I also want to briefly mention that sandy turf is unique in that it is the only eye plant proof turf on which crops can be planted. So if you are actually looking to keep eye plants away from your crops, sand is an excellent choice of turf. Eye plants can also nibble at stone fruit bushes. Wicker can use her book to speed up the production of stone fruit, but if they're transplanted bushes they will need constant fertilization and the books will be slightly less efficient due to the bushes multiple growth stages. I would recommend saving your sprouting stone fruit for a lure plant farm because bushes grown from these will never require fertilization. You can also use lure plants to harvest lichen in the caves, and it's a great way of quickly collecting food for crock potting. One thing to watch out for, any perishable items that travel through a lure plant will come out with only half of its spoilage time remaining. This means your harvested lichen will last one day before going to rot. So this tactic isn't practical unless you are able to immediately throw your harvest into bundling wraps. But considering how closely lichen tends to grow, you could walk away with a lot of veggies as long as you're able to preserve them. Use number six, reed trap. This is the one that gets those wick remains drooling. If you are lucky enough to get this set piece in your world, rejoice. You have been given a rare opportunity at fast access to one of the most tedious basic resources to acquire, cut reeds. These plants are typically spread throughout the swamp, so having a large group of these together should immediately get us thinking about a lure plant. Before we can use the trap, we will need to address the trap part, aka dozens of tentacles. You can certainly throw on armor and get to work clearing them one at a time, and it's time well spent. But you can also lure Berger or Deerclops over to the trap when they spawn, and their area of effect attacks will do a lot of this work for you. Once they're clear, throw a meat bulb down in the middle and come back in a couple days for your first harvest. The best thing about Wicker using books for this farm is that it generates reeds which can be used to craft even more books. I would strongly recommend placing two structures nearby, a rod for lightning protection and an ice fling matic in case of a stray red hound death. Two quick hacks with using wicker books. If you don't like the fact that she goes insane while reading, you can always throw on a bone helmet and the nightmares will not attack you. You can also read books on the looter islands which will conveniently keep your enlightenment zeroed out. Use number seven, summon Abigail. Because the meat bulb qualifies as a mob, 
Defeating one will summon Abigail if her blooming flower is nearby. This makes for a very convenient method of summoning her if no other eligible mobs are available to murder. You also get the fleshy bulb back so you can repeat the summoning as often as needed. Use number 8. Cheese Fuel Weaver. What better use of an immobile veggie mutant than to trap and kill the big endgame boss? With the atrium key inserted and the odd skeleton assembled, plant lure plants around the skeleton in a way that the player cannot squeeze through any space between the bulbs. Insert the heart and teleport yourself outside of the arena. The Fuel Weaver will be stuck inside and easy pickings for a houndiest shootiest. Hope you prepared some extra food because this will take a while. The lure plants might even be ready for harvesting by the time Fuel Weaver goes down. Over time, as you kill more ancient guardians, you can set up more houndias to speed up the process. I gotta say, for a carnivorous tulip, the lure plant really holds its own when it comes to practical application. I hope that this guide has given you at least a few new ideas for how to incorporate these guys into your survival strategy. Big thanks to Lachnish for collaborating with me on this guide and proofreading all of my talking points. Please let me know in the comments what you like to use lure plants for, and please like and subscribe for more Don't Starve Together guides and videos. See you next time.